Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay at the back? Yep, great. Uh, so I am Katie Miller, and I'm an OpenShift developer advocate at Red Hat, based in Australia. I'm not going to be talking about OpenShift today, though. I'm going to be talking about functional programming, or FP for short, with a focus on higher order functions. Uh, I should warn you, though, the last time I gave a conference presentation about FP, I spoke about monads. And the feedback I got was that afterwards, uh, some people looked uh, a bit like this. Uh, so my aim today is to be expanding minds, not exploding brains. So I'm going to try to make this a really gentle introduction to FP, but by its nature, it can be a bit brain stretching. So you know, in case you do feel the need to get out and take a breather, please note your nearest exit, remembering that it may be above you. Uh, seriously, though, uh, if you do feel intimidated by functional programming and some of the kind of foreign sounding terms that go along with it, I'm hoping by the end of this session that feeling will have dissipated because FP is really awesome and it's useful and it's much more accessible than you might think. You certainly don't have to be a genius to do functional programming. And I also think it can be a lot of fun. So I'm hoping we can have a little bit of fun here today. So let's start with the basics. What do I mean when I say functional programming. So functional programming is a paradigm or style of programming. So while people might associate it with particular languages that facilitate it well, uh, you can apply FP principles in any language. So the language I'm going to be using for my code examples today is JavaScript, uh, simply because I think it's the closest thing we have to a universal programming language. But all of the concepts we're going to look at can be applied in any language. So FP is a style of programming that treats computation as the evaluation of functions. And I mean functions in the mathematical sense. So functions in maths will always give you the same output for the same input. And they only use their input to calculate the output. So the addition function is a really classic example. If you give it 1 and 2, it is always going to give you 3. Uh, and so this function is what we call referentially transparent, which means that we can replace a call to the function with the result in our code without changing the overall behavior of our program in any way. So if a function violates referential transparency, we say that it has side effects, um, which is a no. This is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, so using referentially transparent or pure functions like this makes it much easier to reason about our code. It means we can even do equational reasoning on our code, like in mathematics, which is really cool. In contrast, uh, although this function is defined using JavaScript's function keyword, it's not a pure mathematical function at all. It's relying on some mutable global state, and it may do much more than just return a result. So <laughs> although it may appear to work like regular addition some of the time, it also has the potential to blow up in your face. <laughs> so we can't reason about code like this the same way as we could with our pure addition function, uh, which makes it harder to test, uh, harder to parallelize, and harder to spot bugs. So functional programmers like to make their jobs as easy as possible. So they stick to pure functions as much as they can. Now, of course, at some point, you're going to want to do I.O., like writing to a database or getting user input. And there are different ways you might handle that in different languages. But if you do end up including a code that isn't referentially transparent to achieve this, and it's not inevitable that you will, there are ways to maintain purity. But if you do, at the very least, you can isolate that code so you can reason about the pure part of your program. So another aspect of functional programming style that makes it easier to reason about your code is the use of immutability, which I think has already been talked about quite a bit at this conference. So when you're mutating your data structures all the time, as we know, it can be hard to keep track of what state that they're in at any given point. Whereas with immutable data, that concern goes away, and there are optimizations that compilers or interpreters can make accordingly. If you're a developer, you probably already know this, right? Uh, whether it be from using like immutable strings in Java or tuples in Python, or even just retrieving something in Git that you never actually thought you were going to use again. So in order to be able to program in this functional style, there are a few things that it's desirable to have in a language. The primary one is first class functions, which just means that functions are values, like any other value in the language, and they can be treated exactly the same way. It's also useful to have lambdas, which are just anonymous functions, and also closures, which enable uh, functions to access variables that are defined in their surrounding scope. 
So a closure is something that's formed at runtime, and it consists of both the function and its referencing environment. So here's an example in JavaScript. So we have a function that takes a string name, and it returns a function which returns a string identifying the first letter of the name. So as we can see, even though uh, this function that's returned doesn't take this first letter local variable as an input, it's able to access it later on. So even after it's returned its result, uh, you can see we still get different results there depending on what we passed in. And that's because a closure is formed and it has a copy of that local variable. So of course, none of these concepts are particularly new. Functional programming has its roots in a model of computation developed way back in the 1930s called Lambda Calculus. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that it's been growing in popularity in recent years. And I think that's evidenced by the functional features that have been added to a lot of established languages like Java and Python, and also a lot of the new languages that have been popping up with functional support uh, like Clojure, F Sharp, and more recently Elixir. So why are people so keen on FP? Well, I think I've already alluded to a few reasons uh, why FP is beneficial, such as making e uh, code easier to reason about and test. But the motivation I want to focus on today is something that underpins all of that, modularity. So if you create small units of functionality that do one thing well, and then combine those together to create high level functionality, your system is going to be easier to maintain. Anyone who uses a Unix style terminal, which is probably most of you, is well aware of this philosophy. And the exact same idea holds for functional programming. So with functional programming, instead of writing our programs as a series of instructions, we declare functions with particular behavior and then create pipelines to transform our data bit by bit. But it's all very well to create small modular pieces of code. Uh, but according to John Hughes, who wrote a very influential paper called Why Functional Programming Matters, and I have the link to that at the end, uh, what makes FP particularly noteworthy is the two new types of glue, what he calls glue, that it offers to help with sticking all those little pieces of code back together. So the first of those is lazy evaluation, or delaying the computation of values until they're really needed, which I'm not going to have time to uh, talk about really at all today. The second special glue is the focus of today's presentation, higher order functions. So I've mentioned higher order functions, or HOFs, a few times, not that HOF. Uh, and in fact, we've already seen one. So it's about time I define what we're talking about. So a higher order function uh, does one of two things, or perhaps both. It takes a function as a parameter, or returns one as a result. Uh, so the starts with function that we saw a few slides back was higher order because it returned a function. Uh, before we dive into a few more examples of higher order functions, I want to briefly mention a few more aspects of functional programming style, uh, the different ways of building functions. So the first one I think everyone should be aware of is function composition, where you create new functions by gluing together existing functions. So here are an illustration of two pure functions. I've got f of square, which takes a square and returns a circle, and g of star, which takes a star and returns a square. Notice they both deal with squares. One is input and one is output. So we can compose these together to create a new function that takes a star and returns a circle. Now we don't need to care about squares anymore. And you can glue a whole series of functions together that way. Secondly, we have partial application, where we uh, give a function only some of the arguments that it requires and get back a function that's waiting on the remaining arguments before finally giving us our result. So that's the star and square here. And then we uh, did the final two parameters to get a triangle at the end. And finally, we have currying, where we turn multiple argument functions, like this three argument function illustrated, uh, into a chain of functions which each only take a single argument and return a function that takes the next of the original arguments until we finally have supplied everything and get our final result. So this table summarizes a few of the features we've just looked at and the support for them in the four major languages of this conference. As you can see, they all offer some level of support. So, you know, sometimes functional programming is accused of being an ivory tower thing, you know, esoteric. I mean, these things are already in these la all these languages, you know, so it's worth knowing how to use them, I think, uh, to create elegant solutions where it's warranted. So you may have heard that functional programmers don't tend to use loops which is true. The alternative is to use higher order functions. And three particular functions that you'll commonly see used for this purpose are map, filter, and fold, or reduce. These are functional programming's three musketeers, if you like. So we're going to take a little uh, bit of a look at each of them. 
So to help with that, uh, I'm going to use a prototyping tool for D3 visualizations called Tributary, which comes with the functional JavaScript library underscore JS. Um, there are several other JavaScript libraries, and there's lots of debate about which one is best. I'm just using underscore because it's already part of Tributary. So I'm just going to flick over. There we go. So the theme I've chosen for the data today is famous faces, and I've created a kind of visual list where each element has a textual component and a visual component. So at the moment, the textual component is showing an anagram of each name. Can anyone help me out and tell me who these folks are? I'm hoping they're people you recognize. Or if you're good at solving anagrams, you can figure it out. I've got USB bottle openers up for up. <laughs> Does anyone know? Do you recognize these people? Yeah? Guido, yep. Who else? Yeah. Matt's, Grumpy Cat. Brendan Ike, Business Cat. That's good. We've got five. We've got most. Anyone recognize the rest? Yeah, Rich Hickey. Woo. Anyone else? No? Don't know the last two? All right. Colonel Meow, did I hear? <laughs> um, so, ooh, sorry, that's not what I wanted. It's going to be hard to type and hold a mic, but I'll try. So, okay, so what I'm doing here is I basically have hidden away all the D3 logic. If you're interested in D3, you want to look at that. Um, this is all available online. You can have a look at it later. So it's all hidden away in this visualize function. So what we've got going here is we're plucking a property anagram from a famous list, which if I can click here, I'll show you quickly. It's just a list of objects which have particular properties. So that's what we're visualizing. Then I'm rather, uh, so I'm following the principle of immutability here. Rather than mutating this list, we're extending it and adding some display text, the anagrams, and then just showing that on the screen and, and returning this array here. And you can also add some text to that, which I won't try to do because it's going to be hard to type. So, but that's the basic setup of what we've got going. So if I can go back to the slides. <coughs> There we go. So let's start out by looking at the first of our Three Musketeers map. Now this is a function I'm assuming most people will have heard of of you. It's going to get a show of hands. Who's used map? Yes, good. Who's used it for something other than a list? Ooh, okay. Not, not so many. Okay, so yeah, I guess as you now know, map isn't just for lists. Uh, so you may have heard uh, things that have a, a map function, sometimes referred to as functors. That's something you'll hear in functional programming. So Map applies a function to every element in a data structure to produce a new structure, or at least in the functional style, we don't mutate, to produce a new structure with a transformed data. And importantly, it doesn't change the shape of the data. So if you started out with a list of lists, you're still going to have a list of lists at the end, or whatever else. So here's a quick example, and I'll go through this really quickly because I realize map is fairly familiar. So imagine we have a list of strings, and we want to turn them all to uppercase. Here's a classic kind of imperative way of doing this. It should look really familiar. Iterate over them, uh, apply whatever it is you want to do, and then return the result. Uh, contrast this with a more functional style, where we're using underscores map method here. So we take in the list and a function that defines what we want to do with each element. So this is what makes it a higher order function. We're taking in a function. Uh, and you can see from the bottom, we get the same result in each case, but I would argue that the functional one uh, is more succinct. We're abstracting away how we want to traverse the list from the logic of what we want to do with each element, and we're also, at least from what we can see, avoiding the mutation that's going on with that for loop. So I think this is encapsulating a particular pattern, which is something that higher order functions are great for. So let's have a look. Oh, yes. So of course, map isn't just in underscore. It has native support in all four major languages, although the details do differ slightly between them. So have a look at this in tributary. So it's time we're mapping over the uh, textual component of each to turn them into pig Latin. So that's happening in this pigify function here. So using map over the list that we get when we split the string into the individual words, and then doing some manipulation to create a new version, which is pig Latin, and then just displaying that the same way as we did with our anagrams. So notice, same kind of transformation for each element. If we want to do something more visual, uh, so hard to type like this.
There we go. So same kind of thing, but now we're doing something a little bit more visual. So for each element, we're taking it, uh, creating a clone of the images that are displayed and adding something to the end, which is a very stylish moustache. So notice again, we haven't changed the shape of our list. Same thing, but we've just done some kind of transformation with each element. So that's map. Let's move on to our next musketeer, filter. Again, it's one I'm expecting people are familiar with, so I'm going to go pretty quickly. So filter works by applying a predicate uh, function to each element in a data structure to produce a structure that only contains those predicates, which are those elements, rather, that pass the test. So here's an example iterating over a list of strings, similar to before, doing it in imperative style, uh, using a for loop and building up a result versus a functional style where using underscores filter function, uh, we're passing in our predicate and have defined another little function here just to define predicates easily so we don't do it for a specific letter, instead you use a function to create it for whichever character it is we're doing. And then as before, we get the exact same result in each case, but in the functional case we've abstracted away that traversal logic and separated it from what our actual test is. So again, filter has native support in all the four major languages. So let's have a quick look at it in tributary. So this time, filtering textually, we're getting rid of vowels. So we're doing that up here in this no vowels function, uh, going through. So the list this time is the list of characters in our string. So for each character, we're checking, and it's cut off a little bit there, but checking if it's contained using this underscore contains function in this array, so if it's a vowel and then we're negating that. So if it's a vowel, it's not going to pass the test and it'll be filtered out. And again, we could do something a little bit more visual. So we've got this test here, similar to the character one, to test the kind of the element so that we can filter out whichever kind we don't want. So we can visualize. There we go and get just our cats or easily change that to just our humans or whatever else. So that's map and that's filter and they're ones I'm hoping you're already fairly familiar with. The final musketeer is fold or reduce uh, and it's actually the most powerful member of the trio. Uh, and I also think it's the one that people tend to find the most confusing. So I want to spend a little bit more time on it. So fold isn't actually a single function, it's a family of functions, and the family has a lot of different names. So as well as fold and reduce, you may have heard it called accumulate, aggregate, compress, or inject. And the basic idea is to process some recursive data structure. Uh, again, we're looking at lists, but again, it's not limited to lists, can apply to many structures, and repeatedly apply a binary function to each element and an accumulator or partial result uh, to reduce it to some value. And when we say reduce here, that doesn't necessarily imply that the result is going to be smaller than the input data structure. Um, it's just, yeah, depending on what the binary function is. So the accumulator may be given a starting value, but uh, with some versions that we just give the first element to be processed is used instead. It can be left associative or right associative, and it can be strict or lazy. And it's different uh, combinations of these things that give us the different members of the fold function family. So let's start off again by looking at the imperative approach. So this time we want to sum a list of integers. Uh, so start off our accumulator value, ACK, at zero, iterate over the list, kind of continuously pushing each value to it, and then just simply return it. And that works. One, two, three, gives us six, as expected. But notice, again, we've got mutation going on with that for loop, and we've entangled the logic of what we want to do uh, with the way that we're traversing. So to get rid of that, let's define sum recursively. Now, I should mention at this point that there are limitations with the way that uh, JavaScript implements recursion, which mean if you use some of these techniques in prod, you know, you might blow your stack and bad things might happen, so don't do that. Uh, but we're just looking at the concepts today. Be aware the efficiency may vary in your language. I don't have time to go into that, but if you want to know more, uh, Google for tail call optimization and trampolining, and you'll find everything you need to know about it. So this time with our function, uh, we're taking in the accumulator as a parameter. And now we have our recursive base case. So if the list is empty, just return the accumulator. There's nothing left, left to do. 
Otherwise, make a recursive call to our function sum with the tail of the list. So tail's just everything but the first element. That's what list at slice one gives us here. And our new accumulator value that we get by adding ACK with our, our current element that we're processing. And this also works. We start this with zero, we get six. So what about if we wanted to do product? Well, we could do something fairly similar. Again, we've got the recursive base case. Uh, this time, though, when we calculate our new accumulator, we want to multiply, and we want to start our accumulator at 1. Uh, reverse, a little bit trickier to think about, but again, we can do something quite similar. Uh, this time, we want to repeatedly take the first element and prepend it to the result that we've built up, and that will end up doing a reverse. So looking at this, we can see that this isn't very dry. There's a lot of repetition here. Uh, we've got the same parameters every time, the same recursive base case. We have a recursive call each time taking the tail of the list. And then there is just one part, the part in purple here, which is quite different in each case. Uh, so as programmers, obviously, we want to get rid of repetition. Uh, and that's exactly what fold left does for this case, or reduce left. It's just a way of getting rid of the boilerplate of this pattern that you can see right here. So here's how we might define it. So I've called it fold L here. So now we're taking the accumulator parameter, a list, and also some binary function we want to apply. Uh, so hence what makes it a higher order function. So again, we have our recursive base case. And again, we're making a recursive call with the tail of the list. But this time, we're calling our binary function instead to uh, calculate our new accumulator value. So we can define sum again, this time using fold left. Uh, and it becomes a one-liner. We get rid of all that recursive boilerplate. And we could do the same uh, for product and reverse. So it look very similar. And this works. Uh, as you can see here, I've shown both the result and the way it was calculated. Now, notice all the brackets here on the left. That's what I mean when I say it's left associative. Um, so if you find, though, the recursion a bit confusing, note that you could do the same thing with a for loop. It's going to work the same way. Uh, and as I've already alluded to in a language, stack-based language like JavaScript, this may be the more efficient approach. But I'd like to make the point that at least if you do this, you put this in one place. So you only have that for loop and the mutation going on in one place, and then everywhere else you can have the nice abstraction. You don't have to look at the ugly mutation. So that's fold left, but as you probably guessed by now, there is another function in the fold family called fold right, which is right associative. And here's how we might implement it. So at first glance, it might look fairly similar to fold left, but there are some key differences. So we have uh, the same named parameters here. We also have the recursive base case. And we're also passing the tail of the list each time. But this time, the recursive call is inside the call to our binary function. and that. Uh, makes quite a significant difference. Uh, also, uh, by convention, normally with our binary function with fold left, the accumulator parameter will go on the left, and with fold right, on the right. Uh, you can see at the bottom here, we've got another sum defined this time with fold right, and it also works. We get the answer six, but as you can see uh, on the side here, it's been calculated differently. This time, all the brackets are on the right, because it is right associative, uh, but given that addition is an associative function, we got the same result anyway. It didn't matter in this case. So to highlight the differences, here's a case where it does matter. Uh, I think it was mentioned this morning, the cons function. This is a really common function in functional programming. And all it does is prepend an element to a list. So it gives you a new list. You take an element in a list and prepends it. gives you the new list with that at the head. Uh, so if we put cons through fold left and fold right, we get different results. With fold left, we end up reversing our input list. With fold right, it stays the same. So why is this? Let's have a look. Here's the function calls we end up with. Notice associating to the left versus the right. So with fold left, we start with putting one on the front of an empty list, and then two on the front of that, and three on the front of that. Whereas fold right, we start here and put three on the front of an empty list, and then two on the front of that and three. And so we end up constructing a list that looks exactly the same as our input list. Um, so fold L, uh, sometimes referred to as just a for loop with an accumulator. That's probably a good way to think about it. Fold R, however, a lot of people like to think about as simply a replacement for cons in a cons list. So this is just building a list with this cons or construct function. You notice it looks exactly the same as the function above it. So when you're doing a fold right, you're really just replacing cons with your own function. So what have we seen? Yeah, so we've seen that fold left is left associative and fold right is right associative, and that does make a difference when you're dealing with something like a list there or a, a function that isn't associative. 
Fold right can be implemented with fold left uh, and reverse, just by reversing the input, provided you're working with finite lists or finite data structures. In Haskell, for example, fold right can potentially operate on infinite lists, on infinite lazy structures, while fold, fold left cannot. So that's just something to note. It may not matter depending on what language you're using, but good to know. So as I mentioned before, fold reduces the most powerful member of our musketeer trio because map and filter can be defined in terms of fold. So they also fit that recursive pattern. So here's map returned, uh, defined with cons and fold R because we don't want to reverse our input list. And all we're doing is calling cons and they're just running whatever the function is on each element as we prepend it to the result. Likewise with filter, again using cons here, oops, it stopped working, to build up our list. Excuse me. There we go. Uh, of course, by checking the predicate first to see whether we want to include each element. And yet again, this has native support in all the languages of this conference, although only JavaScript calls uh, something natively a reduce right. The others just say do a, re a reverse on reduce left or inject. So let's have a look in tributary. Okay, so what have we got here? So reusing the one kind function we defined earlier, and now I've got uh, some totals that I'm calculating just using a fold left. So we saw before that fold left can do a sum. This is just doing the same thing, but we're defining some uh, function that we're passing in to define what it is that we're actually summing. So summing here is the number of Facebook followers that each one of these people have, and creating the total, which oh, you can't see it too well. They're a tiny bit smaller, you can see that the cats are really creaming the humans there when it comes to Facebook. Uh, and so we're using our filter again here to filter it to cats and humans, filter down the list, and then using the total and doing a fold left. Uh, if we wanted to do something more visual, uh, I've got um, some disguises to apply to our very famous faces, um, but they're in the wrong order, so we want to do a reverse. We've seen already that fold L uh, used with cons, we'll do a reverse on a list. So if I quickly change this so we can see. Uh, where are we? There we go. So there are our, our disguises to hide them from the paparazzi. But yeah, they look a little bit funny, not just because of the disguises. <laughs> They're in a funny order. So if we use our reverse, on our list of costume items here. We get something that looks a little bit more sensible, if I can say that. Um, so yeah, there's a, a visual look at Fold. Is this gonna work? No. There we go. So those are our three musketeers, map, filter, and fold, and they're used frequently in FP, so you should really know them inside out backwards if you're gonna be doing functional programming. But of course, there are endless possibilities uh, when it comes to higher order functions. Uh, anywhere, basically, that you see uh, a pattern, repeated code, like we did with the recursive pattern, it, you know, it's worth thinking to yourself, maybe can I uh, extract some of this logic out into a higher order function instead? So I think we've seen how higher order functions can help us glue together a small, reusable parts of code, uh, but we haven't really stuck uh, many of those resulting units together to create larger level puzzle pieces of functionality. So I've got one last little bit of code and tributary that demonstrates that. So what have we got going on here? So we've created a bit of a popularity contest. I've gone with that theme. Um, again, I'm gonna make it a bit smaller so you can see. Uh, so we've got a lot of code that we've reused, and that's a great thing. This happens a lot in functional programming. We've defined things, small modular pieces, which you can now reuse. So we're reusing all of that. Now I've got four functions here, uh, and they all end with list note. So they're things that we've mostly already seen, something to display the scores, whatever that is, so the, the Twitter or the Facebook rank, uh, something to rank them. So I'm using underscores sort by function just to rank them but that goes uh, smallest to highest, so using reverse, so we have the person with the greatest score first, applying a filter, and also transforming our most popular person in some way. 
Um, yeah, and as I said, not an accident that they all end with list. What this enables us to do is to partially apply these. So that's what's going on here. We're passing in these three functions and creating a little pipeline uh, where we've got each one partially applied to whichever function we passed in, but we haven't got our list yet. That's still yet to come. And we're composing each of those. Uh, so we have each of them happen in turn, starting from bottom to top. And that ends up when we create uh, this reveal popularity down here, we create a transformer and we get the result that you see. And I guess the main point to make with this is not only that we've able, able to reuse a lot of code, little pieces, also that's really easy to change this. If I decide I only want to look uh, at the humans, for example, can easily use the function I've already defined to do that. Ooh, if I can type. Sorry. There we go. We can see that Guido wins. <laughs> um, and if we want to change the criteria, say we, we were looking at Facebook, what if we want Twitter? Or if we want Twitter and Facebook, it's as easy as just changing the logic in one small place. And this happens a lot in functional programming. I think it's a pretty typical thing um, a lot of the time that you write your code in this style, and it might seem a little bit funny at first when you're not used to it, but there's a, a really big payoff in the end. Uh, okay, I'll give up on that. Too hard to type this way. So, what have we learnt? Um, I guess it's fair to say that Guido, the benevolent dictator, is also the ruler uh, of, the, of the internet, but clearly the cats beat him hands down. Um, more importantly though, I think we've seen that functional programming can enable us to write uh, better code that's more modular, easier to test, easier to parallelize, easier to reason about, uh, and that higher order functions play a big role in that. Uh, so we've looked at mat, filter, and fold, but there are many more functions, and of course you should, and you can and should write your own. So I've got some references if you want to learn a little bit more. I especially recommend this one. Learning Haskell will definitely change the way that you code. And yeah, if you want to have a look at these slides, you'll find them here. I'm not going to have time for questions by the looks of it, um, but you can chat to me on Twitter. I'm Code Miller, or come talk to me at the OpenShift booth. Uh, I think we might also have a bit of an OpenShift workshop tomorrow, so you can come there. We can talk about Haskell if you like uh, and whatnot. Thank you very much.